Hi, my name is Armando Vilaseca. I'm the Secretary of Education, and this is the name of this show is Education. Join the conversation. Uh, today's topic is called Education Quality Standards, and you'll hear the phrase EQS used uh, quite a bit. Um, EQS, or the Educational Quality Standards, um, are part of the requirements that schools have to be able to meet in order to for students to graduate. And this is kindergarten through 12th grade. But basically, it uh, outlines what kids need to know, um, what they need to learn, how they need to demonstrate it, and what the schools need to do in order to accomplish that. Um, it's an exciting time because recently the legislators just passed a flexible pathways bill which includes uh, things like personalized learning uh, plans, uh, early college, dual enrollment, and really an opportunity for kids to be <clears throat> much more engaged in their learning. Today with me I have three um, folks who are on the commission and also uh, work quite closely with education. Uh, to my right is Jill Remick, um, project manager for EQS. She's a works with us at the Agency of Education, um, Annie Howell, who's the Chief Academic Officer for the Vermont State Colleges, and Peter Evans, who is a coach and leadership team for youth and adults transforming schools together, called YATS, uh, but also many of you may know Peter as the longtime principal from Montpelier High School. Um, thank you for coming for the show, and um, I look forward to having a, a good conversation with you about the changes that we're all experiencing. Um, Jill, I'm going to start with you so you can maybe give us a little background on this, explain what's going on and what some of the, the steps are. Sure. So the education quality standards are part of the State Board of Education's rules about what schools have to provide for students. Um, we're moving away from what's currently called school quality standards. This is really part of a movement to um, broaden what school looks like, what students' experience is. So um, last summer, the State Board of Education put together an Education Quality Standards Commission. This commission is made up of teachers, principals, superintendents, folks from higher education. Um, Peter and Annie are on that commission to really uh, take a look at the standards in detail, how they can um, best be updated to get students what they really need, tell schools what they can do. Um, it's much more focused on a personalized learning experience for students, not so much how long they sit in a classroom, um, but what they need to succeed and also how to keep those students engaged. So it's been a really exciting conversation to be a part of. It's part of really a national movement towards the personalized learning for students um, while maintaining those high standards. Um, the, the plan is that the Commission has one more meeting that they'll be doing in the end of May. They'll be presenting their final recommendations to the Board in June. Uh, the, June will, uh, the board will then initiate um, rulemaking, so they'll spend the next several months, they'll have a public hearing period, so there's lots of opportunity for the public to weigh in on this. Uh, we've done a lot of outreach um, with schools and folks from the agency, of course, um, and we've been updating the board monthly on this. Um, so my role has simply been to facilitate the conversation, um, to staff the commission, and also to update the board each month. And another place they can look at the uh, current draft of the uh, EQS would be on our website. So they can go to the <coughs> Agency of Education's website and look and, and uh, have an opportunity to see what work that we're doing? That's right. Um, it certainly has been changing frequently throughout okay. the process, um, taking different input from various organizations. So every month there's been a new version of the document that the board has seen and ha that has been up on our website. Um, we would love to have folks check out the draft on our website, look at the existing standards maybe and, and wonder what they would like to see different in there. Um, and at any point in time we would welcome their input. Um, and of course, once the State Board has initiated rulemaking, they'll be holding public right. hearings around the state, and we would hope that people would participate in that as well. Right. Good. Thank you. Um, Annie, it's great to have you on, the, on, the, uh, on this commission because really higher ed is a, is a real partner with us. Um, so you want to talk a little bit about your role and how you see sure. this, how the, the pre-K through 16 uh, right. continuum. Well, you know, I, I started in um, the Vermont State Colleges in September, and before that I was K through 12 for uh, deep in my soul. Um, and when I started working in higher ed, that connection between higher ed and K through 12 was a big part of my role, is thinking about um, how to join those two systems right. and how to make sure that um, what we're thinking about in terms of teaching uh, students who are coming out of high school in college and then on to careers um, is, is, uh, is a readiness that they have in their K through 12 system as well, and um, so so it was great to be part of this community because there are you know 20 plus great cooks in the kitchen all thinking about this from different angles, and uh, the Vermont State Colleges um, has you know been a place where 
students have come from a variety of backgrounds, having lots of different learning experiences, rich personal, professional experiences, um, a long-term history right. of um, accepting that, sometimes offering credits for things that may not have been class credits, um, but recognizing what that looks like. And, and so that, that mission, that vision of what education could look like in a real, um, for students who are critically thinking, who are taking ownership of their learning in professional ways, has been something that the Vermont State Colleges has been about for a long time. So to think about that in K through 12 education and to think about how, how we ensure that students are graduating ready for college right. in that kind of a way or that they're ready for careers in that kind of a way where they're, um, they have the proficiencies, um, the academic proficiencies that they need, whether that's in traditional um, uh, English, math, right. science, and then also um, how to engage as really active citizens right. for yeah. critical thinking skills, um, good communication skills, um, uh, taking ownership over their learning and the kinds of things that they'll need in college. So it was, it was great to be with these cooks in the kitchen and to think about how this document would, uh, would reflect that so that all students are, are in that place when they graduate. Now, Annie, I don't, and I, uh, you know, the, the higher, someone might think, oh, uh, Annie's here, higher ed, because they're looking to take the top students mm. uh, and, and focus on that. But we had a conversation earlier, and, mm -hmm. and we've, that, that really what we're looking at is a much broader perspective on, on kids continuing their education. That's right. I, you know, um, well, there's, I think that some of the same skills that students graduating from high school need for college are the same skills that they might need for the workforce. So, um, you know, we're, we're hoping that kids graduate in, at 12th grade ready for either of those paths. Um, of course, we hope that they come to the Vermont State Colleges right. because of, um, of the, the education that we think that is necessary being part of higher education. Um, but uh, um, but the you know schools I think that a big part of this um, commission and looking at revising this document is how do we ensure that all students are going to be ready for that and uh, and that all schools have um, equal systems. Um, That's huge. Yep. Yeah, uh, that that school leadership um, that curriculum. Um, pedagogies are all set up so that it's really enabling all students to be able to get to that experience. So all students, not just that's, the high that's flyers. Right, that's yeah. right. And I want to emphasize all because we continue mm -hmm. to talk about making sure all students are ready to go on to uh, college or career or continue their education in some way. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted the folks to, to uh, hear that from you as well as they've mm -hmm. probably heard it from me in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter, you come with uh, a, a background as a high school principal, and now you're uh, working as a coach and, and, uh, and doing other things with kids and helping them take leadership responsibility. Mm -hmm. But tell, tell me a little bit about your engaged involvement in this and how your background as a principal is, has helped guide some of the work that we're doing. Well, that, that's, um, that's a pretty straightforward answer. I've, I've always been... Um, involved, uh, whether I've been a principal of an elementary, middle, or high school, with students taking more responsibility for themselves, learning to become good advocates for themselves. And about five years ago, a group of principals in Vermont started uh, this initiative to try to encourage the idea of, of students learning the skills to become better advocates for themselves. We realized that they were lacking in that. Um, so uh, long story short, um, We've, we started a nonprofit. It's evolved. Uh, we have a full-time director now. And our goal, our goal is to work with schools, secondary schools, and engage the adults and the students in learning about becoming um, genuine partners with each other in looking at the school community and looking at uh, ways that students can become more engaged in learning and ultimately mm -hmm. giving skills to the kids, to the students, so that they can become um, uh, owners of their learning. And so this work of uh, educational quality standards, I think, is something that we're really committed to, mainly because the structures within the school uh, have an opportunity to be modified somewhat that will allow for a greater level of, of student involvement, will allow for much more, op many more opportunities for students to take responsibility for their learning. Um, the, the idea of a personal learning plan for great, students yeah. yes. is, um, is just a, a great 
chance for students to become advocates for themselves. Um, our educational system, unfortunately, in many ways has been uh, directed by the adults. And so students get done high school and many times they don't have the skills to take initiative, to, to be responsible for themselves. And, and there are a lot of sad stories about how hard that is for some students to learn. Uh, we're committed to trying to give them the skills so that they can learn that while they're still in high school. Um, personal learning plans, flexible pathways, these are all opportunities that students are going to have. Uh, in some cases, that will be very challenging. The, this will not be the, the kind right. of easy way of learning in right. some ways. Sitting and, back and having it come to you. That's right. right. And so we're looking at, um, I'm looking at the, the new educational quality standards as a way to really, really change the condition within schools so that more of that can happen on behalf of students. Yeah. Peter, you mentioned personal learning plans a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Could you explain to us what a personal learning plan is for those well, of us who don't maybe have that, mm -hmm. that level of knowledge? Sure. Um, you know, we throw that term around a lot, right. and I think there's a, a great amount of misunderstanding um, as if it's something that's very, very foreign to schools and to teachers. The fact is that uh, many schools, even in Vermont, have been using personal learning plans for, for quite some time. Montpelier High School, for mm -hmm. instance, where I was principal, um, 15 years ago started personal learning plans. Basically, it's a roadmap for students that helps them to understand um, the opportunities that they have available to them and how they're going to be able to demonstrate their learning and uh, ultimately graduate from school with a high school diploma. Um, it's a roadmap. It's a, it's a, a set of, um, of ideas, really, that a student has about how they might accomplish four years of high school. And um, we, we, the, the good thing about the, the fact that this is going to become part of the law and, and hopefully the state board adopts this is that uh, for those students who are lucky enough to be in a school where this is an opportunity, um, there probably won't be a whole lot of changes. Right. But for students who are in a school where there has never been any discussion about a personal learning plan, uh, this uh, will be a chance for, for them to experience that as well. So in essence, one of the things that may be different about schools is right now I'm an inc you know, in many schools I'm an incoming freshman. I take you know, five classes that are sort of predetermined my personal learning plan, which I'll come into school with, I may take those five classes, but I may take them in a different way or with some different outcomes. That's right. Um, so, it's, so it's more of, I, I, you know, engagement. And what we find is that particularly high school students, and I think, Peter, you, you know this probably better than anybody, we lose many high school kids, not because they're not bright, not because they're not, they don't have the ability, but they're not engaged and they don't see the connection between what they're learning in school and maybe what right. they want to do in the future, whether it's going on to college or something else. So, um, well, and I think our current system, which is really based on, on seat time, um, yeah. has very little, um, there's very little assurance there that students are going to gain the skills necessary to be able to say that they have um, uh, the necessary knowledge and dispositions to be able to leave high school and take those to the next level. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've sat at graduation and watched students march across the stage and know that they were receiving a high school diploma but not sure that they really were ready for what's next. Mm -hmm. And I think this shift uh, in, in the work that we're going to be doing it, it will allow for a greater level of assurance, will allow for us to say that um, um, let's get beyond the name of the course, let's look at what the learning was like and whether or not students were able to demonstrate that. I was just going to add yeah. that, you know, um, we have a, a section in the document around personalized learning plans and, um, and one of the things that we wrote about in this draft is that it's all, all students in grades 7 through 12. So right. just thinking about a 7th grader, thinking about what it means for them to be in 12th grade, yeah. just that mindset shift of where am I going to be in five years from now and how do I need to get there is that kind of ownership that you're talking about. And we talk about it being reviewed annually and, um, and that people's, you know, allowing people's uh, um, thought process to change, you know, um, and what they might need academically with their proficiencies, how that might change so that they don't just move to the next step and the progressions because the classes were set out for them, but what are they ready for? And this, it ties in really well to this idea of the other, um, the flexible learning Great. options because yes. Because you might be a high school student who says, okay, I know that I need this science class and where else can I get it? And having an adult work with you to say, 
these are some other options of places that you might want to tie right. in your career um, with your your site. How do you get an internship to be able to have that sort of learning experience? So it you know we're hoping that we put these pieces in place so that they all align and feed off of each other and allow that independent, flexible um, uh, learning option, you know, and, and holding holding students accountable to that and, and schools accountable to that kind of proficiency. And it doesn't mean, I think what I heard you say, it doesn't all have to happen within the four walls of the classroom. Right. That's right. Which that that's that sort of connection to the community. I want to come back to that a little bit later, Peter. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I think, as a, from a higher ed perspective, you, you want students who have the ability to think critically and to mm -hmm. sort of be able to manage their learning as opposed to just being told this is mm -hmm. what you're going to be doing for the next four years. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, now, Jill, we've used several times, um, Annie and Peter both, and I think I have t used the word flexible pathways. Mm -hmm. What the heck is a flexible pathway? <laughs> you know, really. That's the sure. It's true. We do. We talk a lot about flexible pathways and multiple pathways. Really, it's a pathway to graduation. So whatever that looks like for an individual student. Um, the Flexible Pathways Initiative legislation that just passed um, out of the state legislature this, this uh, session was a really important piece for the governor's office. Uh, we at the agency were really interested in, and excited about that. Um, it, has, it has a few basic tenets that all allow, sort of open the door for different pathways to graduation for students. What do you mean pathways? Tell me what so, that means. When I walk into high school on yes. the first day, my path might be very different from Annie's path or Peter's path. I might be interested in uh, the example I, we, we've heard in our commission meetings, um, uh, having a maple syrup business at home. Mm -hmm. A lot of kids in Vermont have that at home. It's part of their, their, our culture. Um, there's all kinds of things that are not, um, that you pick up when you do something like that. It might be chemistry, it might be math, it might be a business model. Right. It certainly teaches you a lot of good skill sets. So can I use that to demonstrate some learning in my school? Um, another example would be uh, one of the things that is really exciting about the Flexible Pathways legislation was that it ensures that all students at any high school get at least two college level oh, courses during their high school career. What's that also? They also call that uh, dual enrollment. Dual enrollment. Just so people in so um, students can take college level courses. Um, oftentimes it's actually offered at their high school or at a technical center nearby, but they may also travel to the college campus and take a college level course. So this isn't something that's limited to just students who are certain they're on the college track or who are trying to fill up their time while they're in high school. This is really just as important for students who have not had that experience, who do not necessarily have that aspiration, to try it out and see themselves in that environment and think maybe this is something that I'm interested in. Um, and not only does it help them get towards their high school graduation, but it may also help them once they get to college. Um, one of the things that we hear a lot from higher education is the remediation that students need when they get into college. And how exciting it is, you know, I have a kindergartner going to school this fall, and so I look at this through that lens, and I'm really excited to send her into this universe, because to know that the adults in the school will be giving her all kinds of options and really trying to figure out what works best for her. They'll have a, she'll have a personalized learning plan that she'll, she'll update with the adults and with her parents to make sure she gets the most out of school. Um, another piece of Flexible Pathways is expansion of the early college program. Right now, that's the VAST program where students... What's a VAST mean? VAST stands for the Vermont Academy of Science and Technology. It's um, located at Vermont Technical Center, but it's an independent high school, essentially, where a high school student in their senior year actually becomes a college student during that year. So that's very focused on high-level science and technology and math. Uh, the, the aim of this legislation was really to open that up at other state colleges, at other independent colleges, um, to give more students that opportunity. Right now, it's really limiting to geography and, and, and the, um, the focus. So another college in another part of the state might have an art or drama focus, or they might have a literature or graphics design or, or some other focus. Um, so that's another piece that that, that, that was And they would earn college credit and high school credit simultaneously. That's right. Okay. So, they, to, so when they would graduate with their senior class, even though they may have spent the year that's right. at VTC. That's right. And so the, the goal of all of that, and I should, I should also add that in Flexible Pathways, in the legislation that passed, um, the language about personal learning plans is almost verbatim to what we at the commission 
um, were working on, and that was not by accident. I mean, these really fit nicely together. Um, the, the legislation puts into state statute that schools allow students to have these opportunities, and it makes the commitment at the state level from the legislature that, um, that we do have these priorities, that we want to make sure students all get access to those. Uh, the EQS work is really about ensuring that schools give students those opportunities and the other infrastructure that schools should have in place to give students those opportunities. So it's really building on some of the best practices that a lot of schools in Vermont are already doing. A lot of students already do take dual enrollment, but it's sporadic throughout the state, um, just as one example. So um, between the national movement, the movement in the state house, you know, the priorities we have at the agency, um, and the things that we've heard from the field, I mean, this, is really, this has really been a positive process, and it's really changing what high school especially looks like for students, but, um, but for the better. And I think Annie mentioned earlier equity. You know, mm -hmm. this helps assure equity because what happens in Vermont with our local control is what Peter does in Montpelier, even though maybe a great idea, may not necessarily happen in other places. So what I think the, the legislator and the State Board of Education were trying to make sure is that all kids, regardless of where you live, mm -hmm. had the same opportunities uh, available to them that somebody in Montpelier or U32 or someplace else might have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and tell me a little bit about dual enrollment because mm -hmm. that's a that's a very exciting thing for us, I think, at the K-12 level, uh, but it also is, is exciting for the higher ed folks. And I, I know this is just a small part of, of EQS, but, it, but it's something that I want folks to be aware of. Right. So dual enrollment um, is a program where high school students, as Joe was saying, can take college courses at a college. And there are some places where they can take a, a college level course at their own at high their own school. school. Mm -hmm. um, and next year, um, the funding will double for this, so right. there'll be more opportunities for students to be taking these courses. Um, students can, high school students can take one dual enrollment course in their junior year and one in their senior year, so they can have two. Free of charge for the students. Free of charge for the students. Um, and uh, and, and the, the real, there are many goals for this. Obviously, there's a continuum of students right. who are trying to reach through dual enrollment. Right. There are some who are termed high flyers who may be, and we need to be thinking about mm -hmm. these students who are, um, reaching their their capacity in their high school, right. the kinds of things that they want to be learning are not offered in their high school, and they look to this vast um, uh, college catalog out there and say, where else can I get this learning? Um, and there are also students for whom um, college may not be what they know that they can handle um, or want more college-level experiences to, to be able to um, ensure themselves that they can take right. on that route. And so this is an opportunity for them to take those courses. Um, the Community College of Vermont is, um, is a, has a very extensive um, uh, dual enrollment program and reaches students um, at, at all levels of that continuum. So it's, this is very exciting for us. This is, this is a great bridge from high it's school a, to the yes. K through 16, as you were just talking about. Yes, and, it, and it, again, when you talk about um, new standards and flexible pathways, mm -hmm. this provides opportunities for kids that are available to them that none of us had when we were in school. So That's that right. really is, it, it is exciting. It is. Um, Peter, another exciting part that I see in a lot, and you, when you were principal of Montpelier, were, were doing this before many others, and I see it in the EQS, is that more experiential learning. Mm -hmm. um, that all learning doesn't have to happen in the school. You want to talk a little well, bit about? Montpelier High School, for, for many, many years, long before I started um, as principal, had a, a very well-established community-based learning program that um, use this great laboratory in Montpelier, this, this wonderful community in Montpelier, as a place for students to, to learn. And um, typically the way the program uh, works at Montpelier is if a student um, has a block of time during the week when uh, they, they're not assigned to a class, um, and they typically would have been in a study hall. We don't mm -hmm. do study halls at Montpelier High School. Um, the students are free to go to that uh, community partner. And um, we've had uh, uh, students work with the governor's office. We've had students work with, with your with office. Me, yes. In fact, right. uh, we passed him on the walk down that's here. Right, that's uh, right. We've had students work here at Orca. So um, just to name a few. And so the, the experiences that the students have by getting out in the community, by applying some of what they've learned in classes to a real setting, uh, we continue to hear the, the positives from students about that. And in fact, I, I can tell you so many different stories about students who really weren't sure about what they were interested in, 
what they were passionate about, and they connected with a community partner, and all of a sudden the, the doors opened up. And they come back after they've graduated, they talk about how that uh, led them to really narrow down what their choices were in, in very positive ways. And it might not be the exact match, right. but it led to a, a match. And so I, I think um, being able to use the community to do things like internships, community-based learning, um, service learning will be will will provide so many opportunities for students, and and by them being able to demonstrate their learning that they've achieved through that opportunity will will allow them to meet graduation requirements at the same time. Okay. So it won't just be this elective that's not connected to the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like what I'm hearing is that school's classroom, high, particularly high school, but it's not just limited to high school, we're talking high school now, is really much broader than what most people would look at a high school today. Um, it's the communities as, as a classroom. Mm -hmm. um, colleges, of uh, courses available to high school students, looking at different ways that students graduate from high school. But it's what I do want to say, and I wanted to say this as a something you reminded, that Flexible Pathways is not a, an alternative program. It's not a way of trying to avoid keeping our students graduating with high skills and, and, and um, really providing them with a good education. It's just allowing kids' interest to maybe be more of a guide in how they go through high school. Mm -hmm. um, I would add, too, that one of the things that all of these initiatives require is everybody has something they have to put in on it. It does ask a lot of parents, parents it asks a lot of the, the yeah. students to take that ownership. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's to have the legislation and the EQS work going through um, really shows the commitment that the schools have and the folks working in the schools. This is not, this is not an easy change um, for those who aren't here already. Right. Um, but we've heard nothing but good things about, about where this is happening successfully. And because we're Vermont, we can learn from that. But, but it does, it's asking a lot, you know, that legislation, that asks more of the legislature and, and, and the state. It's showing that we all have a commitment to making this change. It's not just, okay, we'll send our kid off and, and hands right. off. It really does ask for a lot more involvement from the community. Um, and that's a win-win for the community as well. You know, they might end up finding somebody who ends up being an employee someday. Right. Um, and a student might find something they're really excited about. Um, but it takes a little bit of that effort. And that parent there. piece, and, I, and Peter mentioned it earlier, you mentioned it again, that uh, quite often parent involvement at the kindergarten and elementary level is very much supporting in the classroom. As kids get older, there's sometimes harder for parents to be involved with the learning. They don't volunteer in schools like they did in elementary schools, let's say. Mm -hmm. But now with the PLP, they are an integral part of helping their son or daughter sort of navigate through high school mm -hmm. based on their interest. And it's not a... Um, highway that doesn't have off ramps. Mm -hmm. If you have a personal learning plan that maybe you change your mind after you do an internship with somebody and you realize, oh, I didn't really want to be a, mm -hmm. you name whatever it is, that you can alter your personal learning plan, which again keeps parents completely engaged uh, along with the school and the student in the future of the, uh, which to me is, is as a high school principal for many years, that sometimes mm -hmm. disengagement, not that parents want to disengage, but kids sometimes, you know, they want to, they're trying to be more mm -hmm. developmentally, they want more space. This is a way of helping parents continue to stay connected mm -hmm. in guiding their children towards whatever they do, whether mm -hmm. it's continuing their education at a four-year school, two-year school, or in some other, in some other manner. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, just, I was just going to add that, um, I mean, one thing for parents who are thinking about um, what does this all mean for my kids who are in school right now? Yes, and, and, that's a great, yes. And, um, and I, I wonder about the, the, um, the viewer who would think, oh, does this mean that my student is only, my child is only going to be doing maple syrup business right now? Right. And, uh, and to be clear that the educational quality standards also really do address some very, um, uh, what seem like they might be traditional skills, but talk about it in a way that doesn't, say your student needs or your child needs to be in a math class for X number of hours for X number of credits. Instead they say, um, we want your, your child to learn mathematical content and practices including the concepts of algebra and geometry prior to the end of 10th grade. So there's a lot of very, um, uh, the curriculum that we're alluding to is, um, is, is still what you probably, you know, the parents probably right. had in their own high school. Um, maybe not taught the same way, maybe not assessed the same way in terms of what students are getting from it, but those, um, those subject areas are still very critical to, 
to the high school experience. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm really glad, I can't believe I almost forgot it, that you just mentioned the math piece. Mm -hmm. uh, that one of the things that EQS is doing uh, is increasing the math requirements uh, at the high school level so that students are leaving high school with math requirements that will op will allow doors to be open about around in the courses they took. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that the governor, um, Part of this, you know, the, the success with this has been the, the fact that the governor has been talking about this on a regular basis, where last year we were trying to pass this, and because of the fact that the governor was not overseeing education, there wasn't that much engagement. Mm -hmm. I think that's been huge. His, his emphasis to increase math requirements, mm -hmm. not, as you were saying, mm -hmm. um, may not look the same as it did for the parents, but kids will be graduating with, um, at the very least, classes that will allow them to continue their education should they choose to. Yes. Good. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, our 30 minutes are over. and uh, I want to uh, thank you all for coming uh, here and, and sharing with us this really important work you're doing and also to thank you and, and all of the other folks on the EQS committee um, for the hours and hours and hours. What people don't understand is all this work that happens in, around the state of Vermont, it's typically done by volunteers. Um, and I really do appreciate the work you guys are doing. Thank you. Um, hopefully this was a, a good opportunity for you to learn more about what's happening here in Vermont around our uh, educational quality standards and what students are expected to know and do by the time they graduate from high school. Um, and until next month, um, we'll see you again for education. Join the conversation. Thank you.